the human factor came about in a, in a peculiar way, I think. Eddie Dimitrik was the d director, and uh, too much has been said about him being one of the Hollywood ten. Eddie was a good guy and a, and a careful, caring director, and I had worked for him in a picture with uh, Gregory Peck some years earlier. And this thing came up in the human factor, and they had budget problems and what have you. I'm sure they would have rather had Burt Lancaster or somebody, but they couldn't get that. So they, they came to me and Eddie said, this is a good role. We're going to shoot the entire thing in Naples. Um, do you, are you up to it? I said, well, I'll try. I'm not the kid I used to be, but I'll try. And he said, we've got John Mills. We've got Rita Tushingham. We've got a good cast. And um, I said, have you shot in Italy before? He, he said, I've shot just about everywhere. But Naples um, is where we're going to do most of this. And then we have a few days in Rome. So off we went. When you get a script, um, Many times uh, your rule calls for you to be no more than a checkerboard on a checkerboard playing surface. You, you, you just fit in to the pattern somewhere. But you read it and you say, okay, now what can I do with this? You have to particularly be care, careful of mannerisms. A director can help. He'll say, don't, don't do that with your nose, Fred. Uh, because she did it and it's, it's annoying and I'm seeing it. But if you've got any brains at all, you, if you've got particular, there were great actors. I mentioned to you when we were talking a little while ago, Thomas Mitchell. Thomas Mitchell was a very busy actor. You put the camera on Thomas Mitchell and, and he was going to pluck his eyebrows. He was going to drink it. He would turn away and turn back. He was a very, very busy actor. And that's enormously helpful if the actor can remember to do it the same way each time because you, you take a master and then a two shot, then a raker, then another raker, then a close up, and he better remember all of these bits of business because you got to do them again 20 times, you know. So you, you see, what can I bring to this? And it goes on because things are not always the way you plan them in your head. You, you come to work and, and instead of it being an intimate scene between two guys who have just lost a good buddy, they say, we're going to change this. He's going to be on the phone. And now you're talking to a phone and say, you know, well, that called for a little adjustment. You know? The human factor was emotionally complex because you, in order to do this, you really, or in order to do this, the only way I could conceive of doing it was, suppose this really happened. I mean, this is, in the beginning of the picture, the guy comes downstairs and he says, good morning, animals. And he obviously loves his family and, and what have you. And it, it's like most of us. We, we go along on a day-to-day -day wavelength until something momentous changes. He was an easygoing guy. He had a a wife he adored and two little children and what have you. And all of a sudden, boom, they're gone. And what I, I reminded myself again and again when I was preparing for any part of it, just a running, or one scene where I invented taking a little doll and just putting it up here and petting it and talking to it. Um, if that had happened in real life, I, I can't even imagine the amount of grief I would have. I think it would be unspeakable. And that's what I had to try and keep reminding myself as, it, as the picture went on. It really wasn't about killing bad guys. It was about a man whose life was gone, was over. What difference does it make what he did? Now that anybody steal anything that was worth more than your own life. You want me to turn these animals over to the police so that they can be put in jail? So that they can become heroes and ransomed out by another group of psychos to kill somebody else? Not in your life! He's very, Daddy Dimitri was very precise. 
he, as uh, any good director will, was very well prepared for the next day's shooting. He didn't, there was none of this let's wing it from him. You, he knew at the beginning of the day, um, like Hitchcock, he knew not only what he was going to do, but what order he was going to do it and what cuts we're going to make. Aldrich was the same way. Most directors are the same way. They know how much what they have to do, but the great ones know, without it going to the cutting room, where the cuts are going to be. It's, they've already seen the movie. Eddie was, he listened to everybody. He would show displeasure mostly on the physical things. Eddie was not a, a man of great stature, meaning height, but um, uh, although he was not tall, in his entire life was working out and using uh, barbells and using running machines. He had one in his room. Um, so a lot of what we did in Human Factor was running and jumping and going from roofs and what have you. Uh, believe me, if you do that all day long, you can get tired. Uh, but he, although he never yelled or anything, he would show impatience. It's five o'clock and six o'clock in the evening and I'm so damned exhausted, all I want to do is go home and take a hot bath and go to bed. He said, come on, we got to get to, you know. Um, I understood it, but it didn't make it any easier to do. And there was one scene where I have a big chain, a real chain, and I'm whipping it around and some guy is jumping and what have you. We did that all day, and I reached the point because you have to cut it from different ways, and you're doing the chain. That was a heavy piece of chain. And after a day of that, I could hardly move my arms. It was so difficult. But his uh, compassion was missing. He wanted it. To, uh, I understood, but it was difficult to, to live up to what he wanted. The wolves are at the door. Now, I, I can't keep them out forever. What do you mean? Well, what I mean is that your special programs are beginning to take up a little too much of our computer time. Well, simulate a breakdown. Johnny, I know I agreed to help you. Well, what's changed your mind? You. John Mills, of course, uh, was one of Britain's best actors, and he was such an affable, lovely man. We went to his home one Sunday and just sat there. I met some other British actors who couldn't get over how big I was. I came to work one day, and the scene called for John to be sitting at a, a, a radio thing, and I walked up to say good morning behind him in between shots on John. Right? And he stopped, and he said, George, I knew it was either you or a building. <laughs> it's not that he was diminutive, but by British standards, I'm uh, Shrek too, you know. Uh, and Mills is so marvelously professional and always immaculate. He was a delight. Rita was a delight. We had a running gag for years that I was going to meet him at the University of Connecticut at midnight on some stupid day. Now, don't forget, we would get on the phone or wherever, send a message through somebody else on a set. We were at the University of Connecticut. It didn't mean anything. But we liked each other. We really liked each other. I would have loved to have worked with him again. I really would have. Naples, um, in those days, was unbelievable. You, you put lines in the street, you know, three lanes. I don't know why they waste the paint. Nobody ever goes in lines, you know. So as part of the picture, they get, put me in a car and they put a camera on the hood of the car, and they had cameras all during Naples, and Dimitri would say, okay, take off from the hotel and just drive, take that route that we took, and I'm driving through Naples, and, and they say, floor it. If the cops chase you, we'll pay the ticket. And I'm driving, and Naples people drive like maniacs anyway. So I fit right in, all over the place. And we did so much of the picture, like there were a lot of running and a lot of, of everything else. 
We were in Naples and the cast was from everywhere, but the crew were all Italians. And I had heard the expression seven course meal. So they had a big function for the birthday of one of the backers of the movie. And my wife and I were invited and we sat at the dais and the room was full of people. And we sat down, we had some drinks and they served um, a plate of pasta. Oh, it was incredibly good. It was, my wife said, Jesus, good, but don't you think they would have served some salad or, or you know? I said, well, don't say anything. Just, uh, it's, it's good enough. So we ate this plate of pasta. That was the first of seven courses. We started eating at 6.30 at night and by 11 o'clock, my wife and I, we had to work the next day. I'd never eaten so much in my life. The generosity, the waiters come dancing out of the kitchen with piles of food. Uh, and I know what a seven course meal is now. I don't want any more. The end sequence with the, at the, um, um, the market, the big market, the crashing through the what have you, uh, and coming back out, and then all that firing that went on inside, and then coming out, and the bit of business about firing, and it wasn't written. I said, let me just keep firing the blank. Let me just keep. You know, because there's the man, there was nothing else on his line. And Dimitri says, that's a nice bit of business. I'm glad you added that. Some critic didn't like it, but I never understood. It wasn't vicious. Uh, I'm not a critic's darling anyway. But it was right. To me, it was the right thing to do. There was nothing else with him. What is he going to go back to? The YMCA? His life was over. I had nothing to do with naming Shaggy Doo. I'm, I don't think I'm wrong. It was in the script, Shaggy Doo. I loved the name. And I loved the scene where I come out of the apartment and I pick him up and I sit in the chair and, and talk to him. I'm not above doing that in real life. Uh, it, it, it is, it helped feel the anguish, make me try and show the anguish that he was feeling. Because Shaggy Doo is such a loving, it's like the little kitten that's running around here on the floor, Kiki. Kiki, it's a love, you know, Shaggy Doo. And all that's taken away from you. Wow. So many times, so many times you ask yourself, did I do that? Did somebody suggest that? I know I try very hard not to steal the scene, but to, to add something to the scene. Maybe somebody else didn't see. I think any actor worth his while will, will do that. But um, a lot of times, especially as the past gets further and further away, you can't really remember whether you did it or not. We completed the picture and I didn't see it all, but I saw parts of it, and it was quite good. For those of people who do not know what I'm talking about, later on, Charlie Bronson came out with a series of pictures called Death Wish 1, 2, 3, 4. The human factor was Death Wish, but it never got released. The money apparently behind it had something to do with the mafia, and for years it was tied up. It may have been shown somewhere in Europe, it was never shown here. Never shown here. It was a hard picture to do. Um, I got along with Demetric, always did. Um, John Mills was, oh, what a delightful man. Uh, I can't remember anything bad from my own standpoint. Um, and they were very kind in all their remarks uh, when they were finished. 
Yeah? Your name Fonseca? Yeah, Eddie Fonseca. Oh, you must be with the charter flight people. They said on the bus you were going to meet us here. Hey, Agnes, it's the charter flight man. I am six foot four, and it used to be a little bit more than that. In my heyday, cool hand look, whatever, I weighed between 240 and 250. And if I really was overweight, it might be 255 or something like that. The human factor there. Now I go 300 pounds. Uh, I'm a huge man. Not just to John Mills or anything else. Hollywood isn't based on six foot four guys. Everybody is at a height so that nobody looks too big and nobody... It, it's okay to be small, but when you're big, cinematographers will say, I'm off the set with you, George. Can you sit down or can you do something else? It's, it's not structured for big, big guys. Cool Hand Luke, they needed a big, big guy. You know, somebody that kicks the living daylights out of, of, of Luke. But in, in normally, um, it, it, it's not. So the, the, the thing is, what do you say? I am what I am, and, and uh, if I could have changed anything, I'd be a little shorter. My career in movies came basically as a matter of being so much in love with movies ever since I was a child. My mother and father were both in show business. They were in vaudeville. She was a dancer. He was a piano player and an orchestra leader and a composer. Uh, but he died when I was four years old. And when he died, it was 1929, the stock market crashed. And my mother, vaudeville, went belly up. My mother got a job as a waitress. We lived in New York in the Chelsea District, which is a downtown on the west side. And nobody had any money in those days. Your one, uh, your one gleeful moment was Saturdays when you could get into a local theater for 10 cents. And you would sit there all day. You would watch, uh, in those days, it was mostly westerns, and then short subjects, and then cartoons. So if you went in at 10 o'clock in the morning, you could conceivably come out at 5 o'clock in the afternoon having seen everything twice. But in those days, there was only radio. There was no television. It's very difficult to imagine people sitting around a little box that doesn't have pictures coming out of it. But that's what you used to do. Jack Benny was on, and Fred Allen was on three days later, and they had a feud. They, they really were great friends, but on the air, they picked on it, and you couldn't wait to get in front of the, tele uh, the, uh, the radio to listen to them. Remember now, nobody could see you, so you could stand there in your shorts and, and narrate uh, almost anything, and they believed your voice. So I got to pay attention to my, my voice and the way I said things. Well, it was enormously helpful later on when I got to Hollywood and made movies and television because it was an asset that a lot of people don't pay much attention to. How you say a certain line is every bit as important as keeping the camera on you when you say the line. There's a style of acting where when the other person is talking, you eat or something, so the attention will go to you rather than to he or she who is who you're talking to. I've never, I've never marched in that parade. I, I, the play is the thing, and you, you do the play as best you can. And if you use your voice as another part of your arsenal, uh, you, you, you're much better off than if you don't. In 1941, um, I was, what, 15, I guess, 14, 15. And it was Pearl Harbor Day, and we came back from Mass, and we were at my friend's house, and the radio was on, but nobody was listening to it. And one of, somebody in the room said, shush, shush, this is important. And the announcer was saying that Pearl Harbor had just been bombed. Well, we knew that was momentous. 
we had no idea how momentous it was going to be. Everything changed. The entire U.S., which had been in the doldrums because of the crash of 29, did not know. A lot of people felt that the war would be over in 20 minutes. But we didn't know that we were actually going to be, not that Sunday, you, you, I'm 15. Well, it'll be over by the time you're 18. Don't worry about it. Well, couldn't have been more wrong. I enlisted. So I ended up in the infantry. And I ended up not on D-Day, but I ended up in France, in Luxembourg, in Germany. And the end of the war I was in Czechoslovakia. I was in the Battle of the Bulge. And um, I found war to be the horror of Everybody tries to tell you what war is like. War is, war is meant to kill young people, and it's uh, awful. After the war, I stayed on in the service and uh, was assigned with the Armed Forces Radio Service, and I learned broadcasting. And I learned tricks, and I learned timing, and then when I was retired medically in 1958, a job was opened with the Phil Silver Show, the old Bilko Show, which was in its day really the hottest show on the air. So I stayed with them for four and a half years until the show ended. I learned so much from Nat Hike and Phil Silver's, the entire company, all of the actors. I was better than going to any school on earth. I was, I grew up loving actors. I believed everything I saw. I loved mostly the, the character actors. Uh, people whose names wouldn't mean anything to anybody nowadays. Edward Everett Horton, Donald Meek, Thomas Mitchell of Gone with the Wind. They were my heroes. I, I thought they made the picture every bit as much as the stars. Eric Bloor, any of the pictures with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, they surrounded themselves with marvelous character actors. So that when I got lucky enough to be in the business, I never considered myself anything but a character actor, whether I was the leading man or whether I wasn't. I was a character actor being a character lead. When the Academy Award happened in 1968, we were the longest of long shots. Bonnie and Clyde was everybody's darling picture. My friends, uh, the publicist I had, um, co-workers, uh, said, George, show up and, and, you know, just go home and, and you got nominated, you did very good, but you ain't going to win. When Patty Duke announced my name, I happen to remember because I've been asked before, I, I hit myself. I said, wow, and I hit myself and I went up and I accepted the award and I thank you. I said, thank you for the greatest moment of my life, which it was. It still is, it was still the greatest, uh, such a surprise. It's an overwhelming feeling. And the thought did cross my mind, though, when I was leaving, I said to somebody that I was with, we don't have a place to go tonight. They said to me, George, you don't think you're going to have any trouble getting into anywhere tonight, do you? And of course he was right. Um, you realize that forever and ever, they cannot take that back. You won an Academy Award. They, you know, there's no way it expires. You know. It's, uh, it's momentous.